The idea behind this channel is simple. Connect the dots between ARK Invest's market research, stock picks, and daily trading data to highlight the best investing opportunities among companies that are transforming our daily lives. But what if we start applying some of the technology and economic trends that ARK Invest is always talking about to stocks outside of their portfolios? Can we find stocks that would make sense for Kathy Wood to hold in ARK Invest's funds and buy them before she does? The answer is an obvious yes. One of the things every disruptive company has in common is that they use advanced technology to solve modern problems that legacy companies aren't doing a great job of solving for one reason or another. So one thing we can do is use ARK Invest's research to find these modern problems, pick the ones with huge total addressable markets, and see who's solving them regardless of whether ARK Invest holds that company or even invests in that market. Here's a good example. 17 million people in the US are underbanked or completely unbanked. About 4.5% of those are small business owners, so that's about 765,000 small businesses. Traditional banks can't really solve that problem because they have high customer acquisition costs thanks to the physical assets that they need to pay for. Think big buildings in the best parts of major cities, all of the staff inside those buildings, huge networks of ATM machines, and so on. These big banks aren't willing to go after businesses that they don't think can make a positive return for them over time which means they can't afford to serve many of the businesses that are currently unbanked. Pretty ironic, right? Digital banking solutions don't have those physical assets, which means they can make a positive return on much smaller businesses much quicker. Those reduced customer acquisition costs let digital banks do two things. Spend some money poaching smaller businesses from big banks with better offers and acquiring underbanked businesses with less money in the first place since they can still earn a profit off of them while big banks cannot. This big difference in customer acquisition costs between big banks and digital wallets is something that ARK Invest really hammers on in their research on Square, PayPal, and other digital banking solutions found in ARKF, their fintech innovation fund. Well, it turns out that this is a fairly small problem in the United States, because those 765,000 underbanked businesses account for less than 2.5% of all small US businesses. But if you zoom out to the rest of the world, you can see that this is actually a massive problem pretty much everywhere else, which means the market opportunity is actually enormous. Around two thirds of Latin America and the Middle East are underbanked or unbanked completely. Around 60% of Southeast Asia is unbanked. According to a study done by Google, Bain, and C Limited, that number could actually be as high as 75%. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the number is as high as 80%. No one company can solve this massive problem worldwide because the financial culture of each region is different, as are their banking systems and regulations. A one-size-fits-all fintech solution just doesn't make sense. So to fully capitalize on this worldwide opportunity, we need to be picking the winners, plural, that will emerge region by region. Even though ARK Invest is out of Chinese stocks right now, the stock I want to talk about in this episode focuses on solving this problem for small and medium-sized businesses in China, in a way that the Chinese government supports. That's important to recognize in light of the recent regulatory crackdowns. The name of the company is Peak Fintech Group, and it just uplisted to the NASDAQ in early September with the ticker symbol TNT, which is very fitting given how much the stock's price has exploded over the last three months. I think Peak Fintech Group belongs in ARK F, since it uses advanced technology to solve a societal problem that ARK Invest cares about in a market where the problem is massive. Full disclosure, I used to hold about 8,100 shares of this stock with an average cost basis of $2.82 when it was still listed on the OTC markets, and I just sold my last share at $10. So I currently don't own the stock, but I'll 100% be buying back into it when I start my $100,000 public portfolio to compete with Kathy Wood's ARK K, which I'll talk about more at the end of the episode. For now, let's dive into Peak Fintech Group, starting with the problem they're solving. Over 100 million small businesses in China had a hard time getting access to credit over the last three years. That's 130 times more than the US number I gave you earlier, and it's largely attributed to the structure of China's financial system, which is fragmented and hard to navigate. The first part of solving this problem is bringing that data from all of these financial fragments together and standardizing it to make apples to apples decisions about how to connect businesses who need money with lenders who have money. That's what Peak Fintech does. It's basically Tinder for businesses and banks, but uh, without all the swiping and creepy messages. Never mind. 
Lenders want to see bank statements, government approvals, and so on from a business while the business wants to understand the criteria they need to meet in order to get approved for a loan. Once all this data from lenders, brokers, businesses, banks, and other data providers is all in one place and standardized, Peak Fintech uses data analytics and artificial intelligence to match lenders and vendors. If you've been watching my channel for a little while, you'll know that I'm obsessed with this idea of frictionless value transfer. Again, an idea that Kathy Wood and ARK Invest relentlessly focus on. The basic idea of frictionless value transfer is to take an inconvenient but necessary process like getting a loan, going to the doctor, talking to other human beings, ugh, and making it more convenient with technology. Here's how Peak Fintech reduces friction for the participants in their ecosystem. For small and medium-sized enterprises, it's free to sign up and you automatically get matched with all of the lenders you qualify for without needing to shop around, which is often the most difficult and daunting part of getting a loan. Peak Fintech reduces friction on the lender side by putting the right businesses who want the right sized loans right in front of them based on pre-established criteria. That means businesses win in three different ways. They don't need to spend as much money on advertising, they don't need to spend as much money analyzing risk, and they don't need to spend as much time talking to businesses only to find out halfway through the process that that business doesn't qualify for the loan. That's a lot of friction taken out of the process on both sides of the transaction, and both sides should want to pay for that service. And guess what? they do want to pay for that service. In 2018, Peak Fintech helped with over 2,500 transactions and had less than 2% of those loans default. In 2019, they expanded to two other cities and 7x their revenue from $1.6 million to $11.7 million. And in 2020, they acquired the Jin Zhaoer Loan Brokerage Platform, expanding their footprint to 40,000 loan sales reps over 31 cities and more than tripled their annual revenue again to $42.7 million. These physical financial centers help them collaborate with the cities that they're in and foster lending activities with lenders, businesses, and government officials that want that face-to-face -face interaction. But didn't I just say that physical bank branches are bad? In my opinion, that's true here in the United States, but there's no one-size-fits-all banking solution for the whole world. Face-to-face -face interaction is an important part of winning the ability to do business from the Chinese government and city officials in the first place, not just doing business once you're approved to do so. It's a different system there and Peak Fintech feels that they need that physical footprint to expand their reach there even today in a digital world. Peak Fintech is expanding their reach in a few different ways. The first is by partnering with other service providers to help expand the list of things that they can help small businesses do. This includes partnerships with massive distributors that work with Chinese retail giants like JD.com, which is in ArcF and ArcQ right now. These distributors have access to hundreds of thousands of stores and retail clients. They also have a business unit that focuses on payment processing to help facilitate the actual financial transactions between these lenders and vendors, including much sought after services like cash advances. Peak Fintech is also expanding into adjacent markets like social media influencers, which are a popular and powerful marketing tool in the Southeast Asia region. Remember my video on C-Limited when I talked about Shopee's international expansion and the importance of understanding local markets and cultures? You're welcome. Well, Grupocoin, Italy's largest department store chain, has thousands of these influencers and Peak Fintech is willing and able to treat them as small businesses and help them secure short-term loans. Overall, Peak's path to growth involves opening more financial centers in more cities, partnering with more logistics solutions to help businesses with their supply chains, getting in the door with more of China's biggest retailers, and of course, eventually expanding overseas. If we zoom back out, we can see that Peak Fintech is trying to be this connective tissue between businesses, service providers, and financial institutions, and it charges a fee for every transaction inside their ecosystem. Peak Fintech is actually a Canadian company, and the operations of those six business units are actually handled through their Chinese subsidiaries that all take service fees based on what they're providing and to whom. These service fees range from 1 to 4%, depending on the size and type of the transaction. That's the business model, but before I talk about the financials, let me point out a few things about the stock. 
The stock is not an ADR, so these are direct shares and there's no concern of delisting this stock, unlike stocks like Alibaba and NIO. Second, its focus on small and medium-sized businesses is in alignment with the Chinese government and where they want to see growth, production, and employment. Peak Fintech is helping the little guy, not the tech giants. Third, because Peak Fintech is business to business, they're not dealing with sensitive consumer data directly, which is what a lot of the regulatory crackdowns in China were focused on. Because of that, in my opinion, a lot of the Chinese regulatory risks and concerns about future delistings don't apply to Peak Fintech. Here's a Zach's research report published a couple weeks ago, which does a great job of aggregating and organizing all of Peak's most recent financials. At the start of September, Peak Fintech was trading on the OTC markets under the ticker symbol PKKFF, but is now on the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol TNT. As you can see, Peak Fintech is roughly tripling their revenues year over year, pretty much regardless of what quarter you look at. I also want to point out that institutions don't hold this company. Yet, I'm not a financial advisor and this is still a very young company, but in my opinion, this is our opportunity to get out in front of the big guys and ride the wave when they drive the price up. And like I said earlier, this would actually be a perfect fit for Kathy Wood to hold in ARK F, so maybe one of those institutions could even be ARK Invest. The thing I really like about this Zacks report is that it tries to fill in the gaps. Given the lack of China-based fintech platforms, they use US and Canadian names that they think are comparable. They look at the enterprise value to sales ratio of these companies, take out the highest and lowest, and then calculate the average ratio of the rest. I think this enterprise value to sales ratio is a fair way to value companies that are still young and in growth mode. Zacks estimates that Peak's 2021 sales will be around $96 million and their enterprise value will be at just over $1.4 billion. If you give Peak an EV to sales multiple of 14.9, which is this average, you get $13 per share. It's currently trading at under 10, so that's a 30% upside. If you go by Peak Fintech's 2022 sales estimates at an 11.6 EV to sales multiple, the stock could be $32 per share by next year, representing roughly a 3x opportunity from the $10 it is today. One thing I always like to do is consider what happens when a company greatly underperforms. Let's say they only get two-thirds of the sales that they expect in 2022, so $160 million instead of the $238 million they project. That's still a share price of over $21 using these same multiples, so over a 2x in a year and around $10 today instead of that 13. There are obviously a ton of financial metrics that we can look at, but when it comes to hypergrowth companies, I find that financials can change really quickly from quarter to quarter especially if there's a big acquisition, which I always harp on when I cover earnings. There is one other metric that I'll point out here, and that's the ratio of their assets to liabilities. We want to make sure that they're not taking on too much bad debt in order to grow. They currently have about $61 million in assets and about $31 million in liabilities, so that's a healthy asset to debt ratio of roughly 2 to 1. However, that ratio was 2.35 last quarter, so it did shrink quite a bit and we should keep looking at it over time to make sure they're not taking on more and more debt compared to their assets. Right now though, I think their financials are sound, but I'll include a link directly to their investor presentation as well as this Zacks report on Peak Fintech in the description below so you can check out all of their financial information for yourself. Comment below or tweet me at ticker symbol U with your thoughts on Peak Fintech, ticker symbol TNT. Do you think that TNT could end up in ARK F one day or do you think I'm missing something big? Do you invest in companies overseas or do you stick to companies that operate in your local markets? Is the explosive growth of this company exciting to you or do you think it's too soon to tell? I'm excited to hear your thoughts because as of right now, I plan on buying TNT again in my $100,000 portfolio, which I'll be opening up if and when ticker symbol U hits 100,000 subscribers. The goal of that portfolio is to use all of the research and data that I've been going over since I started this channel to show how I would grow an account starting from a clean slate, knowing what I know today. Just like some investors compare their performance to the S&P 500, I'll be comparing mine to ARK-K, ARK Invest's flagship innovation fund over a five-year time horizon, or until I'm ready to admit defeat. Either way, the goal is to provide a fun and interactive investing experience for my amazing community. If you want to learn more about that project or the other holdings in my personal accounts, check out my portfolio reveal episode where I pretty much share every investment I've made since I've started this channel. 
no fluff, just data. I'll leave a link to that in the top right hand corner of your screen right now and in the description below as well. I think you'll really like it. Until next time, this is ticker symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.